when we talk about cranial nerves, uh, talk about cranial nerves. So cranial nerves are actually a special kind of peripheral nerve. Cranial nerves are a special kind of peripheral nerve. Peripheral nerve that comes from the brainstem is the cranial nerve. La. So cranial nerve are peripheral nerve. If let's say there is a single one involved, this is known as mononeuropathy. La. Okay, so usually you have your, um, if it's a median nerve involvement, carpal tunnel syndrome, uh, ulnar nerve involvement, okay, then you have your radial nerve, Saturday night fever, uh, Saturday night uh, fever syndrome. All right, what if it is multiple? Ah, uh, you can't call it uh, polyneuropathy. You first, you must ask yourself whether it's contiguous or non-contiguous. If it is contiguous, that means these are the nerves next to each other. If it is non-contiguous, that means it's maybe one nerve here, one nerve here, one nerve on the face. So if it is contiguous, this is known as polyneuropathy. So example of polyneuropathy is diabetes, diabetes huh? diabetic neuropathy. Non-contiguous is known as mononeuritis multiplex. So that means one nerve, multiple single nerve inflammation in multiplex in multiple area. Okay. So monoreotis multiplex, multiple sclerosis and and all the orang yang serakan dengan nyer lah. So this is so you always ask yourself single, multiple, contiguous, non-contiguous. All right. Easy peasy so far. Okay. So if it is cranial nerve. Again, it's the same thing, almost the same. Not exactly the same, but almost the same. Single, okay, so single is mono neuropathy. Okay, then usually it's the third nerve palsy. La. Then you have your surgical and you have your medical. So usually surgical, your patients, patients pupils will be dilated because the compression of the parasympathetic, which so you have your third nerve, and then the, the parasympathetic will travel on top of it, isn't it. So when there's a compression, so you get a no parasympathetic, pupils become dilated. Okay, medical usually is here because it's the vasa nervorum, uh, nervorum gets blocked. So this one is preserved. So usually is uh, not dilated. Okay, so this is your mononeuropathy. Usually it's the third nerve. La. The rest all will exist together with other things because they are close, they come go out the same holes as other things. Then after that, then you have a multiple, isn't it? Multiple. So multiple, what's the next question you need to ask yourself? Contiguous, non-contiguous. Multiple, non-contiguous, this is known as same shit la, mononeuritis, multiplex. Contiguous, So you ask yourself, ah, this is where it's different from your peripheral nerve. So you ask yourself, is it central? What do you mean by central? Central is it, does it have ataxia? Does it have hornus? Okay, does it have hemiplegia? If you have either one of these things, then if yes, no. If you have either one of these things, then this is a brain stem stroke syndrome okay if not then it is the uh peripheral nerve syndrome okay so what are the peripheral syndromes that you know of so you have three four v1 v2 and six this is Cavernous sinus syndrome because in the cavernous sinus all these friends travel together. But you know in life like you start off with Lima Sakawa one, one will fall in love and then okay sorry guys get married have seven kids and then doesn't mix with the whole guys anymore. So V2 will go off, go and do its own thing, left with three. Because after when they leave the cavernous sinus, V2 will go to the maxillary area. So only 3, 4, V1, and 6 will enter the 
will enter the what to reach the Which orbital fissure? There's a superior and inferior, isn't it? Yeah, ah, excellent. So you have a superior orbital fissure syndrome. Okay. So superior orbital fissure syndrome, if you have blindness, which means second nerve is also involved. This is known as the orbital apex syndrome. Because what's the orbit is like this one, and then there's a cone, so this is the apex there. So two will pass in through here, and the superior orbital nerves will also pass in through here. So if this is affected, orbital apex syndrome. But if it says superior, no blindness, then it's superior orbital fissure syndrome. Sometimes when you do the MRI, there is nothing in the orbit. But you know, picture a superior orbital fissure, but nothing in the orbit, nothing on MRI. So this is known as the Tolosahan syndrome. So Tolosahan syndrome is a diagnosis of exclusion. Lah. You scan the MRI, nothing there. If there's a tumor sitting there, then it's no longer Tolosahan syndrome. But a syndrome is something that has demonstrated the same sign. As long as there's something sitting in the orbital, whether it's a fracture or metastasis or a TB or a whatever, lah, meningioma and all, if it's sitting there, it will cause a superior orbital fissure syndrome. You got a trauma, I whack you, and then you fracture there, and then it slice off all the uh, 3, 4, V1, and 6 at the or, or superior orbital fissure, then you also get a superior orbital fissure syndrome. Doesn't matter what is the, the cause. Okay, it's a, the syndrome is things that have the same signs and symptoms. Okay, but when you MRI, then you see that fracture, uh, uh, tumor sitting there, uh, okay, or uh, I don't know, or maybe a. Uh, 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 granular matus lesion or something like that. Okay, all right. What happen if you have a five and six involvement? This is all five nerve and then six nerve. Usually associated with a mastoiditis. This is the Braden Eagle syndrome. Okay, then you have your six, seven, eight. Okay, sometimes five is involved, not all the time, but usually six, seven, and eight stickers are covered. This is your your cellar, bellow, pontine, angle syndrome. So anything lah, whether it's a malignancy, whether it's a schwannoma, usually it grows from the eight, compressed to the seven, then compressed to the six. So you won't have all one shot. It might start with the eight first, but six, seven, and then even up to the five sometimes. But most of the time it's six, seven, eight. So this is a saddle bellow angle. Now, how you differentiate with the brainstem stroke? Because usually they are all periphery ma, so there's no hemiparesis, there's no contrarectal hemiplegia because the the, the what I call cerebral peduncle across the medulla, so there will be no, but this one is not at the cerebral peduncle, so there will be no hemiparesis, there will be no ataxia, there will be no horners, so there is no central lesions. Okay, so this one is your peripheral syndromes, brainstem stroke syndromes, so you usually have all these. Okay, so if you just have the cranial nerves, then this is a peripheral nerve syndrome. Okay, but after that, later you see in the brainstem stroke syndrome, they have seven, they have eight, then those are different. Okay. Then next you have, then there's a line already. You notice or not, these peripheral nerve syndromes, if you look up the textbook, there's never an 8 and 9 one. Why is there never an 8 and 9? They are always like up 1 to 8. Then after that, 9, 10, 11, 12 will be a different group. Why? Because they go like this, different hole. Okay, 9, 10, 11 go up with the foramen or ballet. Okay, and then they, and then the hypoglossal the will go out to its own foramen uh, rotundum or whatnot. So those when so nine ten eleven twelve when if because they're close they close together, if they fracture, they might affect each other. But the six seven up to eight, they all go out at the different whole one. So then they, they are very rarely. And if let's say your head injury is so severe and keep chronic all the way, then you're probably dead lah. No, you won't survive to become a for the neurologist to study. Okay. 
it's, it's just like usually like spine injury usually you don't get three four one and most is two levels you make compression at c5 c6 rarely you get c5 c6 7 peripheral because if it is so much it's probably like the spine is transected already okay so if let's say you have uh, 9, 10, and 11, this is known as your jugular foramen syndrome. Okay, so if let's say it's pure jugular foramen syndrome, just pure 9, 10, 11, this is known as Vernet. Yeah. Okay. So if let's say uh, you have chocolate formant syndrome and then you also have a harness added on onto it. Okay, 8, 9, 10, 11 and a harness. This is your Pilaret syndrome. Okay, if let's say you got 9, 10, 11 and 12. This is known as your Colette, Colette Sicard syndrome. Okay, 9, 10, 11, 12, Colette Sicard. All right. So if let's say I have a 10 and 11 syndrome, this is known as your Schmidt syndrome. Okay, at this point, it doesn't make much of a difference. 10, 11 and 12, this is your Hugling Jackson. I don't know in the UK, Edinburgh, I think they still use things like Hugling Jackson, you know, because it's, it's uh, British. Uh, all the rest are all like French, so they like, uh, couldn't care less. Okay, but these are all your peripheral nerve syndrome. How are they different from brainstem syndrome? Yes, they affect multiple cranial nerves, but usually they do not have the uh, cross hemiplegia, cross, uh, no ataxia, no harness. All right, so these are peripheral nerve syndrome. Okay, so now this is the thing, brainstem syndrome. Okay, so in order to understand brainstem stroke syndromes, you must first understand Brainstem anatomy. Now, I'm not really good in my neuroanatomy, but then I found out you don't have to know a lot in neuroanatomy. In life, you don't have to know a lot. You just have to know enough. enough. You don't need a lot of money. You just have enough. All right. So, of course, the brainstem, you have your midbrain, pons, and your medulla. Okay. All right. So, you have your midbrain, okay? Because the other half is the same, so I only have to know half of what it is only. Okay, so what is in the front here? This is your cerebral peduncle, isn't it? This one will, if this is affected, it will give you contralateral hemiparesis. Okay? Then after that, what is this thing here in the midbrain? It's called the red nucleus. The red nucleus sends fibers to the opposite cerebellum. So if this is affected, you get a contralateral ataxia. Okay. Then you have your superior cerebellar peduncle. So if this is affected, you get a ipsilateral ataxia. Okay. Right. And then you have your third nerve lock nerve here okay and the sensor all right and then after that you have your tectum tectum is where your the tectum is where all your uh adding a west file all those things is uh. okay so if let's say let's say you have uh Tactile involvement. Okay, what syndrome is this called? Excellent. This is your parinot. Parinot, you will get. Ah, uh, you get a supra nuclear gaze palsy. You cannot look up. You get light near dissociation. What is light near dissociation? Light near dissociation. No, no, no. Light near dissociation is doesn't respond to light, but respond to accommodation. Why? Because the adenovascular is uh, affected. What? That's part of your light, light reflex, isn't it? 
okay and then you also get a uh, convergence retraction nystagmus so what is a convergence retraction nystagmus you give a patient a rolling drum so this is the rolling drum so it moves in this direction and then it has lines like this so the thing will keep on going down so the guy, he cannot look up, isn't it? His eyes goes down, but he, the muscles to pull up cannot go up. So what does he do? All the other muscles will contract, and so it will pull the eye in and together to try to pull the eye up. Because when you, let's say you are traveling on the road, and then there's those posts, your eyes will then move to the front, and move to the front, correct? Because of all the stimulation from the light poles. But this one, the lines are going downwards, so you look down, and then go up. So when you read books also look down and then you go back up. So the eyes will go back, but because they are, they got this supranuclear gaze posi, they cannot look up. So all the other muscles contract to try to pull the eye back up. So this is your paranoid syndrome. So what happens if you got at this level, your superior cerebellar and also your third nerve posi. This my friend is your North Nagel syndrome. Sometimes you may have one third nerve palsy or maybe you may have bilateral third nerve palsy because the third nerve palsy from the next door neighbor is just only here all right you have and you have a ipsilateral uh taxia okay north nagel syndrome if let's say you have a stroke here so the vessel comes out here so you block here you get this you block here you get this you block at the front here again so you got here Red nucleus, so this is your cloud syndrome. Cloud, okay, you get your third nerve palsy and you get your contralateral ataxia. This one is the most common one, always come out MRCP right at the front here. Okay, this is known as your Weber. Weber is third nerve palsy with your contralateral hemiparesis. If your cloud syndrome plus Weber, they combine together, that means you have this whole thing here is combined together. This is known as your Benedict syndrome. So Benedict syndrome will have contralateral ataxia, third nerve palsy, and contralateral hemiparesis. Okay, how do you test for ataxia? Let's see, the site is weak. How do you test for ataxia if the site is weak? You cannot do the finger nose because the hand like drop down. How do you test for ataxia? You can do the leg, but you can also do the hands up. Remember, play. patients with apexia, with cerebellar stroke, cannot play the drums. Anyone here play drums? Two. This one, uh, actually, you need cerebellar. No cerebellar, you cannot play simultaneously. You can be sure be quite like this. You need to do it as fast as you can. Okay, not as accurate, but you know, if the patient is weak, you cannot do the huge shin test. Cannot even leave out how to do huge shin test. They ask him to check simultaneously on both sides. To play the drums, ah. nobody can play. They cannot join the lion dance troupe. Patients with cerebellar ataxia cannot join the lion dance troupe. Okay, because you cannot play the drums properly. Okay, so these are your mid-brain, these are your mid-brain syndromes. Okay. So far so good. Okay, so now we move to our pons. Okay, our pontine syndrome. Okay. Pons is a bit bigger than your midbrain, so because it's so big and then they have a much larger blood vessel, so the pons can be broken down to a medial pons and a lateral pons. Okay? Medial pons, lateral pons. Alright, so they are medial syndromes. Okay, and they are also lateral syndromes. Okay, so to know what are in a lateral syndrome, medial syndrome, you must know what are the what are the structures therein lies therein. Okay, so laterally you have your middle cerebella peduncle. If this is affected, what will happen? You get a ipsilateral ataxia. You also have the lateral spinal thalamic tract 
if this is affected, what we have contralateral loss of pin prick, okay, and loss of temperature. You also have the sympathetics, okay. So if this is affected, you get a hornness. What are the what are the what you call what are the cranial nerves that's located laterally? Nope, not six. Six is medial. Six is medial. Okay, you have your five, you have your eight, okay, you have uh and then you, you got your seven. Okay, five, seven, and eight is located laterally. Only six is located medially. Okay, and then in your middle, same thing la. You still have your cerebral peduncle. So if cerebral peduncle is affected, what will happen? You get a contralateral hemiparesis. One more thing that you see is also the medial lamb niscus if you have a medial and niscus problem what we have you have a contralateral loss of vibration and proprioception and one more thing from the sixth to go to the third nerve the opposite side you have your medial longitudinal fasciculus milf yeah last mlf right you think i am anything a hot pregnant lady or something like that huh? milf all right because this one will go to the third nerve on the other side all right yeah, but you notice or not, all the names will have medial medial. So all the names that have medial in it is located medially. La. So all the medial syndromes will have abnormalities associated with the medial structures. Whereas, would the medial syndrome have loss of vibrate temperature and thin print? No, la, because it's lateral simultaneous track. So again, this is one of the few things where medicine actually makes sense. So you have to look at the name, know which structure is affected in the syndrome, and then you look at and then you look at the name and then you can actually predict it. But of course, as usual, they have all these syndromes, you can name them based on the anatomical structure. No, they want to name it according to the person's names, like what the F, <laughs> okay? So one of the medial syndromes is Milat Gubla. Milat Gubla syndrome. What the heck? Milat Gubler syndrome. What is it, Milat Gubler syndrome? Ah, you have heard this before, you know, you have to say that, but the ones who have never heard it, what is it, Milat Gubler syndrome? It's a medial syndrome. So, let me tell you. Okay, so you have six nerve palsy. So, patient's eyes are in because the abduction is weakened. You have a seven nerve palsy. So, the patient's face is affected. Okay, you got. Uh, loss of contralateral vibration and proprioception. Okay, and then you have contralateral hemiparesis. So quite obviously, quite obviously, what happened? This area here is affected. Lah. So this is Mila Gubla. So, look, 7 nerve is laterally located. Why on earth would uh, Mila Gubla, a medial uh, ventral pontine syndrome, Okay, medial is sometimes the name or other name for it is the ventral, right? they call it ventral pontine. Why will a ventral pontine syndrome also affect seven nerve? But the seven nerve is located laterally. Again, it goes back to your neuro anatomy. So, what is neuro anatomy? Why is seven nerve is lateral, right? Yeah. But why does a medial pontine syndrome give you seven? It goes through the video. Excellent. Oh, very good, Wiki. Okay, so the seven nerve doesn't exit straight away, actually curves around the sixth nerve before it exits. So anything that affects the sixth nerve usually, usually will affect the seven nerve also because of the seven nerve curve around it. So you have a Mila Gubler syndrome. Okay. Then what else? You have four view syndrome. What is four view syndrome? So four view syndrome, same thing. Six. Seven, look at it, contralateral, loss of contralateral vibration and proprioception. See the same shit one. Contralateral hemiparesis. Okay, and because it affected the medial, okay, so 
if you got four wheel, it's also up to here. Okay, so you also have a, a medial longitudinal fasciculus involvement. So, so you have a lateral gaze palsy. So your eyes look in, your eyes look in, this one cannot look out. This one look in, this one cannot look out. So you cannot move to the lateral gaze at all. Co correct? Because your, what the parapontine gaze thing will come down to the, go to the third nerve and then you will control, isn't it? And then after that, you'll send the third nerve or send the signal to the sixth nerve. So this one go in, this one will come out. This one go in, this one will come out. But because this one go in, this one cannot come out. This one go in, this one cannot come out. So you got a, the lateral gaze palsy. So that's your four view syndrome. All right, these are your, then you have, uh, then you have your Brissot. Okay, this one are the rare ones, uh, your Brissot Sicard. Where have I heard this? Colette Sicard just now, isn't it? 12 nurse. So Sicard is like this famous neurologist. Uh, they don't just name one syndrome after themselves. They got usually two or three syndromes after themselves. So it's like, what the heck? Which syndrome is this now? So now this is Brissot Sicard syndrome. Brissot Sicard syndrome, is seven nerve involvement, so you get a myokemia. So basically, the patient gets a uh, seven nerve fasciculation, okay, loss of contralateral vibration and proprioception, okay, contralateral hemiparesis. And then you have Raymond syndrome. Raymond syndrome, patient is lucky, seven nerve is not involved, but only six nerves is involved, plus a contralateral vibration and proprioception loss and a contralateral hemiparesis. Notice or not, what is the common thing? Contralateral loss of vibration, proper session, contralateral hemiparesis in all of them. So you know that these are the ventral syndromes. Okay, so actually, even if you don't know the, actually not knowing the, the, what you call, the eponym is not so important. You look at the patterns, contralateral hemiparesis, contralateral loss of vibration, proper, proper section. Vibration proprioception is carried in the medial and mystery. So it's not here lah. <laughs> Easy. Cerebral peritonco is located medially lah. Ah. What are your lateral lateral syndromes? Okay. So lateral syndromes, they like to use this term Marie Fox. But Marie Fox is not very uh specific. It's just anything that has Anything that has uh what you call uh five seven and eight plus contralateral loss of contralateral pin prick and temperature uh horners okay and uh ipsilateral ataxia is Marie Fox already. But Marie Fox I actually prefer the anatomical one. The anatomical one they have the lateral you have the superior. Eh, sorry. You have the lateral superior pontine syndrome. You have the lateral inferior pontine syndrome. Okay, so this is the. You have the pons here. You have your pons here from the front. You have your medial pons, lateral pons. So you have your superior lateral superior pontine syndrome. And then you have your lateral inferior pontine syndrome. So how so both of these will have contralateral loss of pinprick and loss of temperature. Both also will have hornus. Okay, both also will have ipsilateral ataxia. Okay, so contralateral loss of vibrate pinprick, loss of temperature, hornus and also ipsilateral ataxia. So how do you differentiate between lateral superior pontine and lateral... So, you have to understand, the five nerve is big, the eight nerve is big. The smallest one is actually the seven nerve. So the seven nerve nucleus is only found inferiorly. So lateral inferior pontine syndrome will have five, seven, and eight nerve involvement, whereas lateral superior pontine only 5 and 8. If let's say you see a lateral pontine syndrome, there's only 5 and 8. Then you know there's no 7 involvement, then you know that there's a lateral superior pontine syndrome because the 7 nerve nucleus is located in the inferior pons. 
So if it doesn't strike the interior points, the cylinder will be preserved. But then you get the other things, uh, contralateral, pin print, loss of pin print, contralateral, loss of temperature, corners and all. So what are the arteries that cause this uh, lateral superior pontine syndrome? And what are the arteries that cause the lateral inferior pontine syndrome? And this will be the other name for it. Uh, no, PICA is the lateral medullary syndrome. So what is above the lateral medullary? Above the lateral medullary is the lateral inferior pons, isn't it? So what is the artery above the PICA? Come on, you're right, Anthony 101. What is the, I, I, I know you know, sorry? Yes, ICA. So the other name for lateral inferior pontine syndrome is the anterior inferior cerebellar artery syndrome. Okay, because right below the inferior pons is the lateral medulla, lateral inferior pons is the lateral medulla already, isn't it? So again, knowing your neuroanatomy is very, very important. Lateral superior pontine syndrome, what is the artery that's above the lateral superior pontine syndrome? Sorry? Say the full name because... Say the full name? So there is anterior inferior cerebellar artery. If there's inferior artery, there must... There must be a... But the superior one doesn't anterior or posterior. Only the inferior one has an anterior posterior. Superior cerebellar artery syndrome. So the lateral superior pontine syndrome is the superior cerebellar artery syndrome. Okay? But you know, in life, there are people who are damn unlucky, right? They have combination of both medial syndromes and lateral syndromes. Then they will come out with... Raymond Sestan syndrome. Raymond Sestan again. Hey, you got Raymond syndrome here, which is like a six uh, contralateral, and then you got Raymond Sestan. So confusing. But if you have medial syndromes, lateral syndromes, you have a Raymond Sestan. What happens if you have a bilateral Raymond Sestan? What happened bilateral Raymond Sestan? What happened if you got bilateral Raymond Sestan syndrome? What happened if you got bilateral? You see, ah, uh, six, seven, eight, five, six, seven, eight, all affected. Okay. If it is bilateral Raymond Sestan, that means the whole pons is affected. You are only left with a third nerve. Yes, excellent. Bilateral Raymond is your lock-in syndrome. Okay. okay. Alright. So, Raymond Sestan bilateral, you get a uh, lock-in. So, again, let's go into the medulla. See, the anatomy is not that difficult, isn't it? There are a lot of things that... Okay, so that there is also one where... All the all this middle cerebellar is not affected, the lateral is not affected, the cerebral peduncle is not affected. It only affects the cranial nerve. So five, six, seven, eight is all affected. Okay, five, six, seven, eight. Only the cranial nerves are affected together. This is known as your Gasparini. Gasparini syndrome is your five, six, seven, eight. So you got five, six, seven, eight involvement, but you got no cerebellum peduncle involvement. It's just in the center there. Okay, that's your Gasparini syndrome. All right, let's look at your ah medulla. So again, medulla is a lot very similar to the pons. Again, you have your medial medulla, you have your lateral medulla. Okay, and then what are the nerves in the what is the cranial nerve in your medial medulla? Twelve. So how to remember what are the medial cranial nerves? The medial cranial nerves is 3, 6, and 12. Okay, so 3, 6, and 12. 3 times 2 is 6. 6 times 2 is 12. So these are your medial nerves. So very simple to remember one. So if you have 12 nerve involvement, that's a medial medullary syndrome already. If you have 6 nerve involvement, usually because the 7 nerve curve, so 6 and 7 nerve will be your ventral pontine syndrome. So cranial nerves, brain stem stroke is actually easy, isn't it? Just give me the symptoms. I don't have to come and okay lah. I don't. There are there are times when you don't have to come and see the patient. You can make a diagnosis, but there are times you have to come and see the patient. Okay, but if you just give me whatever, I can tell you locate which part of the brain, and then you do an MRI and confirm my findings. 
Okay, seven. And again, what are the structures there? You have your medial and meniscus. Okay, and what is here? Your cerebral peduncle. So if this is affected, contralateral hemiparesis is affected. Loss of contralateral vibration and proprioception. What is this thing in the inferior? What is the cerebellar peduncle in the medulla there? Your inferior cerebellar peduncle. Even though it's a different structure, different name, but if the thing is affected, it's ipsilateral ataxia. You still have your sympathetic descending pathway. So then this one affected, it will be your hornus. You still have your lateral spinal thalamic tract. So this one affected, you have loss of your pinprick and you loss of your temperature. And what are the cranial nerves nucleus that's located in the lateral medulla? Okay, 9, 10, 11, you don't really this, call, call this thing nucleus ambiguous. 9, 10, 11, all, all thrown in here. But there's also another thing. Rule of 4 is actually a lie. Rule of 4 is a lie. Because 5 and 8 is actually so large, it stretches into the medulla. So 5, the exception is 5 and 8. Okay, rule of 4 is useful, la, but 5 and 8 actually stretches. That's why if you read the complete list of possible symptoms in lateral medullary syndrome, they contain, what do they contain? You see lateral loss of sensation, which is the five, and you also have the tinnitus and loss of balance, isn't it? Uh, which is eight, la. where else? That means five and eight is not just only in the pons, five and eight actually stretch into the medulla. All right, so again, same principle, you have your, you have your lateral syndromes, you have your medial syndromes, and you also have your lateral syndromes. So what are the medial syndromes that you know of? Medial medullary syndromes. Okay. So Dejarine is, okay, contralateral hemiparesis, okay, and 12th nerve palsy. Okay, there is actually a Spiller syndrome. Spiller, unfortunately for Spiller, Spiller is the student of Dejarine. So Spiller's discovery was actually contralateral hemiparesis, 12th nerve palsy, and contralateral loss of vibration and proprioception because medial lemniscus involvement also. But because people always confuse him and his teacher, so Spiller syndrome people also call Dejarine syndrome. When Spiller, when Dejerin originally described, he only described 12th nerve palsy with the cerebral peduncle. It doesn't have a contralateral vibration proprioception. Spiller is the one. <laughs> okay, uh, okay, come, let's talk about the lateral syndromes. So, lateral, what are the lateral syndromes you know of? Our famous Mr. Wallenberg, lah. Okay, Wallenberg. Okay, otherwise it's known as the lateral medullary syndrome. Okay, and then lateral medullary syndrome, what is the... Artery that's involved. What is below the ICA? It's the pica, la. Okay, the pica. All right. So, without looking at the book, just by looking at the structure, how do you know what is the structure? What is the symptoms of lateral medullary syndrome? I know there is ipsilateral ataxia. There's an ipsilateral hornus. There's a contralateral loss of pinprick and temperature. Okay, because nine, ten, and eleven is involved, so I know that there is a dysphagia dysphonia because the vagus nerve also. Uh, innovates the vocal cords and all. All right, I will know that ipsilateral loss of facial sensation and also tinnitus loss of hearing and also uh, maybe some giddiness ataxia because of the uh, uh, what you call uh, vestibular cochlear nerve involvement. Okay, an inability, even sometimes inability to shrug the ipsilateral side. Correct? Ah. So this is your Wallenberg syndrome. Okay, sometimes a Wallenberg may also have contralateral. So, you see, in neurology, uh, the, the ischemia is not going to say, oh, I reached the line already, I won't become even more ischemic. Sometimes the ischemia may spread even a bit over, okay, because of the variance in the uh, arteries and all that sort of thing. So, if we have Wallenberg plus contralateral hemiparesis, this is known as... Okay, plus... Uh, contralateral hemiparesis. That means it's stretching over to the other side already. You have your Babinski. Hey, where have I seen this name before? Babinski? Now you Where have I seen the name Babinski before? There, your Babinski sign. Lah. Okay, Russian neurologist. Okay, so Wallenberg, 
there is contralateral hemiparesis. Okay, but no ipsilateral ataxia. This is your Chenais, C-E-N-A-I-S, Sestan. Again, A, where have you seen this name? Your Raymond Sestan syndrome. So Sestan is already one of those famous neurologists. They name four, five things after the cell. It's like, which one is which already? Nobody remembers. That's why the important thing is actually not to remember the eponym, is to remember where is, what are the symptoms, then you know which structures are involved. C-H-E-N-A-I-S dash C-E-S-T-A-N. All right. What happens if you're one of those damn unlucky people again? They have medial syndromes and also lateral syndromes all added together. So this is your, your medial syndromes and lateral syndromes added all together. This is your hemimedullary syndrome. This is known as your Reinhold syndrome. Reinhold syndrome. Okay, what happens if you just have a, again, sometimes you just have a nine and 10 involvement. Just the cranial nerve involvement, 9 and 10 involvement. This is your Avelli syndrome. And then if you got 10 and 12, 10 and 12 is Tapia. Tapia is very famous. Why is Tapia famous? How was Tapia syndrome first discovered? In Spain, they have all these uh, bull fighters, the matadors. So they put her, put her, and then sometimes the bull shot the horn, go into the brainstem. Not enough to destroy the brainstem and kill that guy, but just enough the tip of the spine damage the 10th nerve and the 12th nerve. Basically just damage the inside here, but preserving everything else so that the guy doesn't die. Okay, lucky lah, lucky that fella. So then they, they, that's how they discover the 10 and 12 involvement. Just the cranial nerve nucleus is destroyed. Tapia syndrome. So these are the Tapia and Gasparini are the only one that the cranial nerves are involved. The rest will all have the other structure so you can actually predict which part of the brainstem they are affected. So, how many brainstem syndromes do you have? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21. Yeah, so 21 brainstem stroke syndromes. So, don't remember the names. The names are just, again, that's like I said, to show off. But know where, what are the symptoms, then you know where, what are the structures involved. But you know what are the structures involved, you know where it is. Whether it's lateral medial, in the pons, in the medulla, and then you can name the artery already, la. that's all. Alright? That's it. La. So, long story short, if let's say there is contralateral hemiparesis, con contralateral loss of vibration and proprioception, you know it's a medial or ventral syndrome. If it's lateral ataxia, it's lateral harness. Contralateral loss of pinprick, you know it's a lateral syndrome. Okay? If there is the 5, 6, 7, 8 nerves involved, then you know it's pontine. 9, 10, 11, 12, you know those are in your medulla. So you know either it's a medulla, lateral medullary syndrome, medial medullary syndrome, lateral pontine syndrome, ventral pontine syndrome. The midbrain, because it's small, they don't have lateral medial, but you can see it moves from the back to the front. So tectum, peritonot, if it's lateral ataxia, north nagel, further a bit to the front, contralateral ataxia, claw, Wherever is right at the front is chemiparesis with your third nerve palsy. And that's it. Brainstem stroke is actually very, very simple. Yeah. So by no you if you tell me a patient how many brainstem stroke, I'm like, hey, let's go and see the patient first. Then you can make the prediction and then you go and get an MRI. And then you see how right I am or how wrong I am. Okay? Yeah. And then the cortical, cortical strokes, usually how you differentiate from brainstem strokes? Yes, the three days, the phasia, and nausea, and all. So if the patient has problems speaking, so if, let's say, uh, uncle, uncle, can I examine you? Patient just looks straight out like that. You know already, it's cortical strokes, dominant side. You see, patient is right-handed, see the patient's hands are like, patient is right-handed, cortical on the dominant side. We, a patient who cannot answer you, you already can give the diagnosis. Just by opening your mouth, I can give you a diagnosis already. That should be... That's neurology. Yeah, it can be very, very simple or it's just very, very difficult if you don't know the anatomy and all that sort of thing and the function and the physiology. Okay? So, uh, I think that's all for today. That's all for today. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for your kind attention.